Okay, everybody, welcome once again to another episode of the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A, where we help you be fit and live free by taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise. I'm Matt Schifferly, and I'm finally coming to you live here from my brand new apartment here in Denver, Colorado, and I'm absolutely thrilled, still kind of working out a few kinks as far as getting the lighting right, and I know the acoustics aren't quite right exactly just yet, but it's a work in progress, but yes, brand new very excited about my new toys here. I got my brand new uh, bike for commuting as I'm riding my bike around a lot more now that I'm living here in the city. My Wild Gym Dash, so the body weight master, is currently in hibernation mode, aka storage. But this is a brand new pull up unit that I got from wildgym.com. I got my NOSC suspension straps as well. Very excited about my new digs and the new gym. And I'm here to bring about new content here because this week's episode as always is sponsored by the red delta project library all of the books that i'm going to be probably referencing in today's episode like grind style calisthenics overcoming isometrics micro workouts and on and on and on as well as the new quick read series which are short read pdfs simple ideas that make a very big difference in your healthy lifestyle those are all available on the rdp merch store down below, all the links are there as well. So as I'm referencing these sorts of things, you can explore those in the description. Today's episode is all about programming. I get lots of questions whenever I open the floor to a lot of particularly the Ask Me Anything episodes where people are saying, what if I program my workouts this way? What if I program them that way? Or can you take a look at this program and see what you think about things? So I'm gonna open up the floor for anybody who wants to ask their questions today and to get a little bit of an assessment over your team or your program and stuff. But first I wanted to cover four of the biggest traits that all successful programs have. Because ultimately your success does not come from your workout program or routine. It's not whether or not you do upper body first or lower body first. It's not how many times a week are you working your biceps or whether or not you do cardio first or anything like this. We can get lost in the weeds when it comes to programming workouts over details that frankly probably don't matter a whole lot. Instead, like everything we do here at RDP, when we take a fundamental approach and we recognize the compass needles that point us in the direction we need to go in, you can make the decisions that is best for you over the programming variables that are going to work best for your circumstances, your resources, your goals, and your preferences so you know what's actually better for you because honestly, I don't know you. I don't know what you can do. I don't know what your habits are like. I don't know what your situation is like. So I can't really give you the best advice in the world because I don't know what you should be doing. (laughs) How am I supposed to know if working out three times a week is too much or even not enough? Because I don't know how you're feeling about if you work out three times a week. I don't know if that's conflicting with your MMA and full contact underground Yahtzee club, for all I know. There's lots of different variables in everybody's life that are influencing whether or not a certain programming variable is effective or ineffective. And a lot of times these variables are always changing. So you're in the best position to make a lot of these decisions. And we'll be going over the framework today that's going to give you the tools to know what's best for you so you don't have to spend a lot of time and wasting uh, all of your energy going down the internet rabbit hole saying, one guy says to work out this way, this other person says to work out this other way. Honestly, they're guessing. They really don't know what's best for you because they don't know you, but you do. And we've got uh, folks coming in already. Adnan is a... here to say, hey, Snifrat, good to see you as well, my friend. Kobo uh, coming in with the first question. Hey, Matt, how would you train program for short distance race, uh, like a two-mile run? Thank you very much. So obviously, we train specifically for what we want. Train for the test, as uh, the uh, saying would go. And the more we can do that, the better. So we don't want to get too lost with a lot of uh, kind of distracted programming whenever we're looking at something like this happens all the time where people are like, okay, you NFL lineman, you're going to go and do a, like a 10 K over the weekend or something. It's like, why their, their bouts are like 20 seconds, 30 seconds. If that, why are you having them run for an hour? It's uh, good to train for the test. So obviously run two miles. The more specific our training is to the actual thing we want to improve, the more functionally, uh, applicable it's going to be. So we don't want to get distracted. This happens a lot with strength and conditioning, where particularly in my world in martial arts, people are like, I want to be a really good martial artist. 
So they spend a lot of time in the gym and they're like, okay, here, kettlebells are good and functional training. I got cables and stuff. You know, what's the best way to train for martial arts, martial arts training for your sidekick. If you want to really improve your sidekick, do better sidekicks. If you want to improve your stamina in BJJ, program your BJJ so that you're challenging your stamina. Because if there's any principle when it comes to programming anything in fitness, it's you gain that which you challenge. You gain the qualities you challenge. If you challenge your strength, you're going to get stronger. If you challenge your stamina, you're going to gain endurance. So if you're challenging your ability to run two miles, you're going to get better at running two miles. Then what you can do is take note of the things that may be a little bit of, I wouldn't say a handicap, but a shortcoming during your runs. Like, oh man, when I'm running, my calves are really cramping up and getting tired or my legs are getting tired or I'm getting winded or my hips uh, feel really tight or what have you. So a lot of times the supplemental program that you have for strength training is about showing up those weak links. Like, oh, I just don't feel like my hamstrings and glutes are really engaging very much while I'm running those short distances or they peter out really quickly. Like I'm good for a mile, but that second mile is not so good. Okay. Then we can program that. Say, let's engage those hamstrings and glutes, like with isometric training. Let's get some pop and power with some kettlebell swings or Olympic cleans or what have you. Then we can go and apply the training that's supplemental to make sure that it's getting us something we want because we don't want to just keep throwing work at you. That's a big mistake a lot of athletes make is they assume that more is always better. But always remember that we live in a finite world, my friend. You have only so much time and so much energy and so much recovery. And most of those resources can and should be used up by your sport not the supplemental training. If you're spending more time and energy in the gym than you are out on the track or the trail, wherever you're running, then your priorities are way out of whack because I don't care how much you can deadlift and how many kettlebell swings you can do. If you're not really running, you're never going to be a good runner. Same thing with martial arts or golf or whatever. So train for exactly the specific thing you want. Take note of your weaknesses or shortcomings, and then train to shore up some of those weaknesses and shortcomings. And it's usually going to take a couple of exercises to be able to do that sort of thing. And that's going to make the biggest difference right there. <clears throat> Great question. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's see what else we got. <laughs> I always get this question every time I get a new, new place. It's like, are the straps on the right BDSM straps? Well, they can be if you want them to be. <laughs> I used to, seriously, the, one of my first gyms that I ever built uh, my home gyms, it was in a basement, like a really dark, damp basement. And not only did I have straps, but I had chains on the wall too, because I would use them for like weighted calisthenics. And people would come down and I'd be like just getting wine from the wine cellar or something. And they'd be like, mm, didn't know you were into this sort of thing, Matt. Okay, whatever. I'm going upstairs now. But uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, the, the joke I always get because I like to hang my straps. I always look at exercise equipment as a functional art. Uh, I've never really thought of it as just purely practical tools and stuff. I love the way things are designed and NOSC makes some of the most beautifully designed straps in my humble opinion. So I like to hang them up as well. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just a habit I have here. Uh, Formal Goose Foundation is uh, coming on. How do you improve my hair growth? God knows. If you figure that one out, let me know. I mean, the, the hair growth is like wrinkle cream kind of thing. It's like everybody claims to have figured it out and everybody's like, this is how to regrow hair and everything. But at best, you're kind of maybe sort of doing it. I know Finistride, Finistride has got some uh, research behind it, minoxidil. But again, this stuff is hit or miss approach at best. You know, if we really had reliable ways to address uh you know, male pattern baldness and hair loss and stuff, we wouldn't have it. Uh, it's that simple. So uh, good luck with that one is basically all I can say. Dave, it's good to see you, my friend. Hey, Matt, how do you like to program to deal with weaknesses? Uh, very good, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, weaker pull versus push, frequently pulling versus intensity pulling. Just asking, I know it should be tailored, but generally speaking. That's a very good, insightful question there, Dave, because there's a lots of things we need to ask first. The first and foremost thing is, if we're looking at a weakness, is it even worth addressing? So going back to the conversation earlier about running, sometimes we're looking at a weakness that may not really have that much holding us back. So a lot of times people will have this debate over, should you strengthen your weaknesses 
or should you just not worry about them too much and delegate them out like in business and stuff? Unfortunately, in fitness, a lot of times you can't delegate that stuff out, but sometimes you can. Like if you have a weakness or it's like, I just can't stay consistent or accountable to it, then a lot of times people hire coaches like me just for the single reason that like, I know you're there. I know you're going to make me show up and work hard. I'm not going to do it for myself. Therefore, I'm delegating that responsibility to moi, the trainer. And so that can be done it is just see if it's something that even needs to be addressed or if it's something that you can have someone else handle. Uh, the other thing to consider with weaknesses is a lot of times it has to do again with stability. I've always said this, you're only as strong as you are stable. So a lot of times when people have discrepancies in push or pull or upper lower body and stuff, we're looking at more of a stability issue. I was just training a young lady this morning and she's like, I feel great pulling, but my push, it just, it does not feel good. It feels terrible. Lo and behold, big surprise. She, we found out her scapular stability, particularly her lat strength was really, really low and her lat engagement. So I got her on some isometrics to get those lats engaged. And she was like, God, this is, feels like the first time in years I've actually felt my lats actually turn on. I'm like, yeah, isometrics is really good for doing that sort of thing. So a lot of times when we're looking at a weakness, in a one side of the body or one area, we're looking at a stability issue because stability, when you improve stability, strength automatically happens. You go to any sort of strength seminar. I've been to seminars on kettlebells and odd object lifting and uh, power lifting and calisthenics and every all these sorts of things. 90% of the information in all of them is just about how to become more stable tension control, bracing, breathing properly, grip the floor with your toes, all of that sort of thing is about improving stability because you will get more stable, strength just comes. So when you have strength weaknesses and imbalances, you almost inevitably have stability imbalances. And you can tell this sort of thing a lot of times by watching yourself on video. If one limb is working differently than the other, you know, if you're doing rows and your arms are tight to the side and your shoulders are moving great, but then you're doing push-ups and you're winging around like chickens, you know, your chicken wing kind of thing and your shoulders are hunching up and stuff. That's a good place to start looking for that sort of thing. Great question there, Dave. Thank you. Porter 1992, a good year, says, tell me you don't know anything about fitness without telling me you don't know anything about fitness. Well, let's see. Anybody who says it's not that simple is usually true, but at the same time, not that, not that clearly defined on how to apply fitness practically. So it's like, it's not as simple as calorie balance. Actually it is, but calorie balance isn't simple. Anybody making those statements, that's usually falling into that category. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. Let, so I'm getting a little off track here, a little off track. You guys are getting into the great questions. Love the insights you guys are coming in for, but I promised you more meat today which is what are the four things that we really want to have as our compass needles for our programming? And the first thing that is most important about an effective program is just using something that allows you to just get the work in. That's our first and foremost objective because a lot of times being able to effectively train the body just means getting the work in at all. So we were talking about running. We were talking about uh, being able to strengthen certain areas of the body, like pushing versus pulling. The first order of business is, can you just get the work in to begin with? And when I work with clients, a large part of programming variables just simply deal with, when, how do we get you running? <laughs> how do we get you practicing pull-ups? How do we get you doing your sidekicks or whatever? It's largely about just, how do we get you able to do the work? Because the body is built that it will adapt to whatever work you give it, regardless of how it's getting there. Okay? If I take a razor blade and I cut my hand, my hand will heal no matter what. I don't need to be on a regimen. I don't need to be on a schedule. I don't need to have an ice bath with it or anything like that. The body will adapt to whatever you're giving it. You just have to find a way to get the thing done and in. So when we're looking at programming, a large degree of it is just, when can you work out? How many times can you work out during the week? You know, people debate all the time, work out once a week versus twice a week versus three. 
when can you do it? <laughs> That's all I'm asking you. I can definitely work out twice a week, but three times is going to be really pushing it with my schedule. Great. Twice a week it is. But what does the science say? Who cares what the science says? You have to work on a practical level first and foremost. It doesn't matter if all the research in the world says four times a week of doing bicep curls is the best way to hit your biceps. If for whatever reason in your schedule and your preferences and stuff, you're only hitting it twice, then you're going to hit it twice and you got to make it work with twice. And don't worry about optimal. Don't worry about best. Don't worry about what is supposedly the greatest way to do things. We've got to get practical first. That's why I've got my pull-up rig right there. I have a fully equipped, really awesome kick-ass gym literally right below me. It's on, I'm on the second floor. It's on the first floor. It's a gorgeous gym. It's awesome. It's wonderful. I still spent four hours yesterday trying to figure out how to get that thing one mounted to the wall. Why? Because it's a lot easier for me to get the work in if I have a pull-up bar in my living space. I know that about me. It's just the way I am. If I've got that gym downstairs and I'm relying on that, whole weeks can go by and I'm never going to go to that gym. But I know that I can get the pull-ups in as a microwave in a burrito. <laughs> as I'm just waiting for the ads to play on YouTube or something, I can get a couple sets in. That's all that needs to happen. You just got to get the work in. So a lot of your programming variables are going to basically be around what's going to allow me to get the work done, the necessary work I need to be uh, doing. And then a lot of your decisions about how often you're doing things, when are you doing it during the day, what type of equipment you're using and stuff will be based on that of what's just going to give you the best chance of getting in the work and sticking to it consistently. If you told me you can only work out downstairs in the gym, I know just in my heart of hearts that I'm just not going to do it consistently. It's just too out of sight, out of mind. It's just not there. But if that pull-up bar, bar is there staring at me every single day, I'm going to get it in. So that's just knowing me personally, what makes it work for me. And that's going to be the best way for you is just can you get the work in at all? AB is asking, got back into fitness after an ACL tear. Ouch. Sorry to hear that, my friend. Uh, Nordic guy uh, got me inspired about Nordic uh, seemed pointless until you can actually do one. And that's the problem with those. A lot of people can't do Nordic curls, which is why I usually don't program them. Glad I found your channel again for suspended hamstring curls. Game changer. Thank you. So yeah, you, you basically went along with the line of thought I was having is Nordic curls are great if you can do them. The problem is they've got such a high level of resistance and you know, people are like, but if you have a band and you rig this up and you've got all this other, it's like, why don't we make this a lot simpler and go with a different type of hamstring curl, shall we? Um, because a lot of times when I see people doing Nordic curls, it's really crappy, slow, half rep negatives before they're just catching themselves. There's better ways to program about it. Dan Osek, it's good to see you. Hey Matt, is it even possible to overtrain with isometrics? Even though I fatigue the muscles fully, I feel I can keep going uh, on the ISO chain of isomax the very next day. Yeah, that's one of the great things about isometrics is they don't tax your body as a whole nearly as much, not just the muscle, but the whole body. And a lot of times when it comes to recovery, and that's the next point I'm going to be making, well, I'll just make it right now, is that when we're programming things, remember, you don't need to recover from exercise. You don't need to recover from training. You need to recover from fatigue. Okay, that's the thing to always base things off of because a lot of times people are saying, well, can I train this every day? Oh, no, wait, this guy says I need to only do it once a week. And some people say twice a Base all of it on your recovery from fatigue and you'll get the answers you need because anything I give you is a guess. Yeah, train biceps once a week. I mean, four times a week. I mean, every other day or I'm just guessing. I don't know. I don't because I don't know how far you're pushing. I don't know how hard you're working. I don't know your volume. I don't know other lifestyle stressors that are going on. I've, I've trained people for over 20 years. I've changed the frequency on people very frequently because they'd be like, dude, I am just not recovering from my workouts. I'm like, why? What, what's going on? You know, and inevitably it's like, well, I'm stressed out at work and I'm doing this other sort of project that's really taking up my time and energy. And I've got a lot of anxiety about this thing that's going on in my family and on and on and on. Remember, stress just builds up, doesn't matter what the source is. So it's like, yeah, you've got a full cup right now. Your life is stressing you out like crazy. Let's downshift into training twice a week instead of three times a week. I'm like, well, shouldn't, isn't that less? It's like, no, because you're not recovering. 
If you're not recovering, you just can't bring much to the table on the next workout. And at the end of the day, that's what we really need. So don't be afraid to change variables up in order to recover better. But with some things like isometrics, there's not nearly as much stress. You don't need nearly as much recovery. If you don't need as much recovery, do it as much as you like and let your body be your guide. Because sometimes I've done isometrics and you know I'd pop up into a handstand the next day and my shoulders would be like, uh-oh, <laughs> nope, not happening, dude. Like you've got much less energy than you think you do right now. It's like, okay, well then... I guess I'm recovering, you know, same thing with isometrics. I'll do a, a leg workout a day or two before, and then I'll be like, yeah, I'll do some leg exercises here, get some hack squats or some isomax squats and stuff. And it's like, why can't I get the damn thing to beep? Like I've got it on the load. I usually, I can't get it to beep. Why? Because my legs are tired. You know, of course you have less energy you're bringing to the exercise. Need more recovery. That's it's that simple. So, bottom line to answer your question here, Dan, if you can go, go. I'm not a fan of like, you, you know, you, you got to wait three days before you work a muscle again, or you got to work a, this every other day. If you need to rest, rest. If you can go, go. Who cares what the time frame is? If you can go, go by all means. If you're still hitting your loads and your timing variables and stuff with the ISO chain or ISO max, great. Keep going. More training is going to be better as far as the frequency goes, if you can keep getting that progression going. And that's one of the big advantages of isometrics. If you can do it hard more frequently, you're just speeding up the recovery and training process. So you're going to get results a heck of a lot faster, which is why a lot of people get much stronger with isometrics than with conventional lifting, because they don't need as much recovery. Dave is saying, hey man, to delve into the stability to address weaknesses, back to that again, uh, that seems like fertile ground for frequency uh, micros, grease to groove. Absolutely, Dave. Very, very good uh, insight there. Because at the end of the day, don't forget, folks, that strength is a skill. Yes, we are pushing the musculature. Yes, we're creating fatigue and we're working it from a, a metabolic standpoint. But at the end of the day, your ability to effectively train your body boils down to how skillful you are at doing the exercise. Again, the young lady I was training today, she was like, I don't know why I can't get the, the push-ups to feel good and stuff. It's like, bottom line, you suck at using your own muscles. I didn't use those exact words, but that's what really boils down to. Most of your success in any exercise and stuff boils down to your neuromuscular proficiency that I cover in my book, Overcoming Isometrics. If you improve your neuromuscular proficiency, everything you do works so much better, regardless of any other variables regardless of your programming variables, regardless of how hard you're pushing yourself. If you get better at using your muscles for the technique, you will get better results with it, bottom line. But on the other hand, if your neuromuscular proficiency is terrible, like I can't seem to really engage my lats very well when doing push-ups, you're always going to have compromised results regardless of how hard you're working, regardless of how well you're programming your variables, regardless of anything else. Neuromuscular proficiency is the foundation of your success in training. That's why I always recommend those isometrics because it's the fastest and easiest way to improve your neuromuscular proficiency. And yes, having frequent micro workouts, skills, things like that go a long way to improving that a lot faster because you're practicing a lot more. Think of if you practice the piano for five minutes once a week versus three hours every day, how fast would you become uh, proficient at using the piano. This does take practice. Hard work alone does not do you nearly as much as we think it is, my friends. We need to become proficient at using our muscles. Mike G is asking, hey Matt, good example of this for me is if I modified my two times a week upper lower split to one time per week upper lower and then one week full body, one time a week full body to accommodate mountain biking on the weekends. Oh yeah, very insightful. So don't be afraid to change your programming according to life changes. So my man, Mike here is a mountain biker like myself. And yeah, from season to season, our demands upon our body and our stress levels and our recovery levels can be wildly altered and very different from one season to the next. So don't be afraid to change up your programming to accommodate. Don't keep forcing old programs into new scenarios that no longer align for you. Very good insight there. Uh, Mike. 
Sigma Ego is saying, Matt, I appreciate these streams. My current home program is full body uh, workouts three times a week. Classic. Hard to go wrong with those. It is effective to do compound exercises, push up, pull up, dips, and very good. And it's isolation exercises on different days. I wouldn't do it so much on the different days there, Sigma. Uh, I would do it more of as a finisher. Because ultimately, remember that when you're doing an exercise, if you're bending your elbow, your biceps are working. So you've got rows, you've got pull ups, you know, bent over rows if you're using weights, and then you've got bicep curls. So your biceps are working in either case. They don't, the body doesn't really know necessarily what different exercises are. It just knows, do I need to contract this muscle? So if you're doing the curls, let's say you, you've got three body, uh, your full body three times a week. So you're doing pull ups Monday, curls on Tuesday. And then rows on Wednesday, you've worked your biceps three days in a row. And eventually at some point, you're just going to kind of burn them out. And always remember that you can do things every single day, but the real goal is not necessarily to just burn out the muscle and work really hard. The goal is to progress our training abilities. So you want to get into each workout saying, I think I can do more than before with the muscle. I can go heavier. I can do a couple more reps. I can get a better technique, more range of motion, whatever it is. You don't get results from hard work. You get results from progression. So you want to give yourself the best chance of progression. Don't take, as I do, too much pleasure in just hard work for its own sake. No one ever got successful by working hard. You get successful from progress, making progressions, doing something better than before. And if you're doing things too uh, frequently, and you're not allowing the recovery, your body's just gonna hold you back from that progression. You're gonna be able to do it. It's not like your arms are gonna fall off if you don't uh, give yourself enough recovery, but you're gonna get you know, your 10 pull-ups on Monday, you do your curls, and then on, two, on Wednesday, you get like nine pull-ups or eight pull-ups. You're still getting a good pump, you're still going to failure, you're still doing all that stuff, which is kind of a bit of a false flag as far as, oh, it's got to be effective if I'm going to failure. It's got to be effective if I'm getting a pump. It's like, yeah, but your performance is going down. You didn't do as well. Conversely, if you get 10 pull-ups on Monday, you rest a little bit and then you're like, well, I'll take it easy and do some curls on Wednesday, let's say. And then you try your pull-ups on Friday and you get 15. Whew, there you go. That's a sign you're actually on the right track. So you, you want to always make that progression your goal. Not hard work, not the pump, not going to failure, not even the routine. The routine itself or the program is not the goal. Don't make it the goal to just do the program. You don't get results by doing the program. You get results by improving what you're doing. And so when you make that your compass needle, change whatever you think is going to give you the best chance of that. Like, I think I might be able to better make better progress if I work out one extra day a week. Okay, great. Give it a shot. See what happens. Or no, maybe if I work one less day a week, I'll have more recovery. Okay, great. Try that too. <laughs> you know, either way could potentially help you. But the progression and the proficiency, getting better at what you're doing, that's the goal. That's what produces the result. Mm. Michael Dropweight Daddy's in the house. Good afternoon, Matt. The shoulders are progressing. Great, bro. Thank you very much. It's always been a hard one for me. I've long had shoulder issues. Uh, and again, it stems to stability. Poor engagement in the back, poor alignment in my shoulders, lots and lots of um, issues with my shoulders. I had, when I made, well, actually, that was why I started calisthenics training, was because I had blown out my right shoulder. And it was a good two years before I could do even a halfway decent push up again, because my right shoulder was in such just bad shape. So I had to kind of work around it and stuff. So it, it thank you very much, Michael. It, it's always been a weak link for me. Earthlight is saying, hey, Matt, is multiple exercise ageless uh, angles, sorry, <laughs> uh, is multiple exercise angles optimal or necessary for strength and hypertrophy, i.e. push-ups when I have good dip progression or rows when good pull-up, et cetera? So yes and no. Uh, I'm a big fan of changing up angles as long as it's big enough. Now, don't make the mistake I made where one of the first weight machines that I ever had, it was called a Pro Spot. And it had a weight bench and it had an adjustable angles. And I would do three sets of 10 bench presses at every single angle of the bench. <laughs> and it was a little overkill because remember, if you're going to make a change in your workouts, a lot of times subtle changes are good for just changing a bit of the flavor. But as far as the stimulus goes, they really don't do all that much. So it's a lot of work for not really any great benefit. So whenever people are saying, I want another pull exercise, I'm going to change the angle. 
change the angle in a big way, like what you're saying, go from vertical to horizontal. Or one of my favorites is do dips and then do like handstand push-ups or overhead presses. Change the angle in a big way. And you're going to get more when you have that much more of an angle difference. Absolutely. I'm not saying you need it in the same workout. I'm not even saying you need it in the same periodization block or anything. But having that much of a different angle change can definitely bring you some benefit. And I think if you don't use those angles, you're going to be uh, losing out to some degree. You can certainly emphasize something like a lot of calisthenics guys. They'll emphasize the vertical pulling motions of pull-ups all the time. And then they'll supplement with rows and that's okay, but definitely mix in those different angles. You're going to be better off for it. Plus it gives you a little bit more of a well-rounded approach for working the musculature around a joint may help to stave off a little bit of injuries as well. All right. Thank you. So we're covering two of the first two things in programming. One is just, can you get in the work you need to do? Two is, can you get the recovery in as well? Because if you don't recover very well, you're not going to be able to progress as well as you can. And number three is making sure that your programming and your exercise selection and stuff is in alignment with your goals. And I see this mistake made all the time where people will have an objective and I'll look at their program and it's like half of these exercises have almost nothing to do with your goal. And you're programming it in such a way that's not really in alignment with it either. Like you say, you want to get stronger. It's like, yeah, I want to get a lot stronger. It's like, then why the hell are you doing a hundred pushups? Like that's light exercise. Remember time and intensity always on that balance. That's why people have asked me sometimes they're like, can you do a hundred pushups? I'm like, why would I ever do pushups that are that easy? I want to get stronger. It'd be the same thing as if you went into the gym and just lifted an empty barbell for a hundred reps, they'd be like, you know, you can put weight on that, right? <laughs> you know, you can make it harder. So it comes back to what I was saying earlier. You gain that which you challenge. You want to program for challenging the functional capabilities you want to improve. Challenge your strong strength, you get stronger. Challenge your endurance, you build stamina. Challenge your stability, you will become more stable. Make sure that your programming and your exercise selection are in alignment with what you actually want to do with your body. And to a degree, if you're looking for aesthetic things, we want to make sure that we're kind of fatiguing the muscles to hopefully stimulate some of that hypertrophy. But don't get too lost in thinking that if something is just hard, that it's worthwhile. There's a million ways you can kick your own ass that have nothing to do with your goals. It is most certainly possible for work to be not so much a waste of time because everything does something, but does it do the thing you want it to do? And this is why I'm often critical of some exercises that are kind of like a general overall approach, but they're not specific. They don't do anything uh, particularly well, like the burpee. I've gotten a lot of heat for that one. But to me, the burpee looks like just one of those things that takes a lot of effort and it doesn't really do anything well other than make you good at burpees. <laughs> like if you needed to pass a burpee PT test, then yeah, it's a great exercise. But people all the time are looking at it like, okay, you've got mobility and you got power and you got cardio and you've got strength and you got all these qualities. I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't do any of them very well. Like if you wanted to build any of those qualities, the burpee is the one of the last things I'd ever give you because it's not in alignment with those things. So be aware of what are you doing that is more direct towards your goals. And you're going to be saving a lot of time and a lot of energy and getting a hell of a lot better results as a result. So Alden, uh, <clears throat> Aladdin saying, saying, can I increase my max pushups while being, while still being in slight calorie surplus? Probably just depends on how much uh, fat you're putting on there, buddy. Uh, you're going to gain strength uh, for sure, but uh, just watch that, that scale. Uh, watch the, the body fat levels. You know, you're not going to help your, pu your push-up uh, numbers if you're getting a lot fatter. Um, and max push-ups, I'm assuming you're talking your number of repetitions, not your actual strength. Uh, so you're looking for more endurance here. Uh, so your numbers may go down, but don't underestimate <laughs> even a few pounds on the body can make a big difference. I know people who they drop five pounds just five pounds. They're like, yeah, I'm five pounds later. And suddenly they're getting three more pull-ups and they're like, God, these push-ups are getting a lot easier. It's like, well, you drop five pounds. I'm like, yeah, but it's only five pounds. I'm like, yeah, but that's five pounds. <laughs> you know, a few pounds can make a big difference when it comes to calisthenics because it's all about strength to weight ratio. 
Hassan is saying, what do you think uh, best accessories for body weight focused workouts? Example, uh, things like dumbbells, weight vests, or fat grips. Oh, lots of toys you can play with, my friend. Mm. So obviously, if you haven't guessed, my straps, you know, suspension straps are my always my go-to just because it gives you so much more options when it comes to your body weight training. Suspension straps. I wrote the book Suspension Calisthenics for that reason, just because it basically it's a weight machine in your pocket. Whatever you do on a weight machine, you can do with suspension straps. And it gives you more of programming variability. It gives you more exercise variety, things like chest flies, tricep extensions, hamstring curls. You get so much out of those things. And the ones from NAS, they're like 40, 50 bucks at the most. They're one of the best investments you can make for your body weight training. Uh, second to that, I would say just a regular good old dip belt. If you want to get into weighted stuff, you know, the Kensui weight vests are my favorite weight vests because they use weight plates. But weight vests can be much more cumbersome. And usually, most of the time when we're adding weight to things, it's going to be dips and pull-ups anyway. So a dip belt is a good way to go about it uh, is if you're looking for weighted calisthenics. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would say some sort of like a rotating handle, like the Kensui uh, swivel handles that they have, just to give you some variety of pulling. Because I know a lot of times people have trouble with their elbows or the wrists and the joints when they're using a classic straight bar like the one there. So having the ability to swivel and pivot with something that you're pulling or like those angle 90 grips that you see out there, I don't know if they still make them, uh, that can be a good just little accessory that you can add into that as well. Um, I was gonna make another point with, or, but yeah, if you have the suspension handles, uh, those will swivel and pivot too. <laughs> so you've got that automatically when you have a suspension strap. So I would say, yeah, definitely suspension straps would be the way to go for uh, something to add into your body weight training if you don't have it already. Or rings, you know, same thing. Super Prime 117. It's good to see you again, my friend. How many working sets would you do per workout per week for dual sports athletes? What percentage of the workout should be isometrics and overcoming isometrics? Yeah. A lot to unpack here. So one is I never have a prescribed number of working sets uh, because, again, it's about the objective of your training in your goal. So when I'm programming and I'm doing my own workouts, I do whatever number of sets I can get for the day. You know, so, for example, with a lot of my programs, my grind stuff, calisthenics, my uh, push-pull squat program that just came out, I order things up where I focus on strength first and hypertrophy second, where I'm basically burning out the muscle. Now, again, strength is a skill. So I will do something like, uh, you know, weighted pull-ups or something, and I'm focusing on the skill of strength. So I'm keeping the resistance high, the reps low, and I'll just do however many sets I can do for the, for the day because I want to keep going and get as much as I can out of it. I'm not going to give you a specific number because, again, I'm guessing. I don't know. You could get three sets in and feel like, great, now I'm feeling warmed up and ready to go. No, you have to stop. Why? Because you did three sets. But now my muscles, I feel like I'm ready to tear down the walls. I'm feeling great. Let's go. No, you're done. Why? Because you hit some arbitrary number that someone pulled out of a hat? What does the research say? Who cares what the research says? What can you do? Everything about training boils down to what can you do? And that's going to change every single day every single week and every single month. Some days you may get two sets. And after two sets, I've literally gone on the dip bar. I'm like set number two. And I'm like, oh God, oh geez. Yeah, I'm, all right, that's it. I guess I'm done. You know, cause my muscles are like, you're done. You're burned out. Other times I'm like, okay, here we go. Set number seven, let's go. <laughs> you know, I keep going. This is great. I got energy today for whatever reason. I'm always basing things off of my capabilities. Never an arbitrary number. Because if I can go, I go and I keep going. But if I'm done, I'm done. Two sets, five sets, whatever. So that's why I'm always going off of how many sets I can do. And then if you're talking about uh, sport athletes, again, it boils down to recovery. Do you need to recover and have fresh legs for practice tomorrow? Or does it not really matter because it's a light scrimmage or whatever? Always base that stuff off of your recovery. How fresh do you need to be? If you need to be more fresh, don't do as much work. Don't have as much fatigue. But if you're re uh, not needing to uh, have any energy, sometimes I'll ask people on a, like a Friday or something, we'll be hitting the legs. I'm like, you're not running like a 10K this weekend or anything, right? Because here in Colorado, everybody's doing something on the weekends. 
And they're like, oh, no, no, I'm good. I'm like, okay, let's thrust the legs. Let's go. You know, <laughs> let's do sissy squats until you can't straighten your legs anymore. Great. But if they were like, yeah, I've got a 5K or I'm hiking a 14er tomorrow, I'm like, okay, one more set and then we'll call it there. Let's not burn it out too much kind of thing because I need, you need your legs tomorrow. So it's usually based on that sort of thing, but it always boils down to what can you do? What can you do? Always asking yourself, what can you do? If you can do more, do more. If you can't really do as much, don't do as much. And base your answer of how many sets on that because that's going to be much more applicable to your circumstances. And um, isometrics versus an, uh, over, overcoming isometrics, remember, it's just another form of strength training. So you have whatever range and um, ratio that you like. It's just still just strength training. So you can do 100%, 90%, 50%, however you want to do it. Uh, and basically go with what you feel like for the day. And if uh, you prefer one, because sometimes I'll be like, oh, dude, I'm totally on this isometrics kick. And it'll be like 90% of everything I'm doing in your, my workouts. And other times I'll be like, ah, I'm just kind of getting tired of the isometrics and I'll barely do it at all. It's largely based on preference uh, because at the end of the day, I'm just trying to work my muscles really hard. I don't care how I do it. <laughs> Super Prime is saying, asking, excuse me, <clears throat> do you think it's a good idea to sprinkle in some light sport specific technical work or sport specific reaction work in between sets to make better use of time and increase um, your vig vigilance. Um, maybe, I mean, it, you, you gotta be careful about how that's recovering. I mean, yeah, it, it depends on what you're doing. So it, it all boils down again, what's the goal of your workout? If you're like, I wanna get stronger, it's like, okay, do your pull-ups and now you're doing like sprints and cone drills and things like that. And the next time you get onto the pull-up bar, you're not bringing as much energy to it. Well, you just compromised your pull-ups. Again, it all boils down to that energy allocation. You only have so much energy. Are you using it in the best way for your goal? Or are you compromising your goal for that sort of thing? That's always what to base your decisions off of is how is this helping or hurting my objective? And I like to keep my objectives really simple when I'm doing my training. If I'm jumping up on that pull-up bar and I'm getting my pull-ups in, I don't wanna be thinking about Taekwondo. I don't wanna be thinking about my sidekicks or explosive push-ups or anything. All I, a singular focus, I'm trying to get stronger on my pulling. That's it. And you wanna get, and I get a laser focus. That's why I, you know, I did a very short stint in CrossFit and I never liked that because it's like, great, pull-ups. Okay, now go for a run. I'm like, what, why, why? Why the hell are we going for a run? I don't want to run. I want to work on my pull-ups. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of like, why don't we throw anything in there? Okay, do your pull-ups. Now go for a run. Now set up this chessboard. Now bake a souffle. Now paint this fence. You know, it's like, why don't we just add work for the sake of work? You know, kind of thing. Be very selective about what you're doing. That cat is saying, hey, Matt, good to see you. Got any tips for a grease groove type of training? I found a few reps every hour or so. Great works great for me. Is there any way to boost my muscle growth with this approach? So remember with muscle growth, we're just trying to fatigue the muscle. You can do it slow or you can do it quickly. Uh, but when it comes to creating that stimulus for hypertrophy, we're just burning out the muscle. And you can take all day to do that or you can do it in two minutes. Personal preference, who, whatever you like to do. Grease the groove is more about a practice sort of thing. Uh, like, uh, you know, I can't seem to kick up into a handstand very well. Okay, I want you to do it five times a day however you like, just get the practice in. So you get comfortable kicking up into the handstand or hanging from the bar. Whenever you're looking at, I'm just not very proficient at doing something, then I wanna practice it more. That's grease the groove. When it comes to hypertrophy, you can do that with anything. You can do it with any kind of training that you like, um, but uh, the burnout is kind of what you're going for. You're trying to effectively like cook the muscle, if you will. So again, you could take all day to do that, or you can make it happen in two minutes. It's going to be roughly the same result either way. Go on the personal preference with that. It's not like there's one best way to go about it. And actually, that's a good question for you, though, is, well, what's going to afford you the better way to cook in the muscle? If you're like, well, if I do it all day, I'm kind of building up the fatigue, but I don't know, I'm kind of just tired at the end of the day versus if I said, okay, you know, hit your pull-ups. Uh, really hard and, you know, pushing into that red zone for a few hard sets, which one is harder and generating more fatigue in the muscle? Oh, definitely this version or that version. Okay. Well then go off of that. Go with what your body's talking to you. 
Sniff rat, how you doing? Uh, you gain that which you challenge. That needs to be a t-shirt. Ah, oh, that is a good idea. I should make that. Put that in the RDP merch store. Dave is saying, make sure there's some balance too. Don't skip leg day. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for bringing that up, Dave. Because a lot of times when people are like, what do you think of this program? What do you think of my routine and stuff? The number one thing I'm looking for is, is there imbalance somewhere? Very prevalent in calisthenics training where guys will be like push-ups, 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 15 different kinds of pull-up variations. And I'm looking at like, where's the leg? <laughs> what are you doing for your lower body? Uh, you know, I walk a lot or something. Don't make the mistake I used to make where I was like, well, I ride my bike everywhere. It's like, no, <laughs> that, that's not quite going to cut it. Yeah, that'll definitely do something. You know, riding my bike around Denver now for commuting is great. I can definitely feel it making a difference in my legs. But I'm sure as hell not going to skip my leg workouts, not even by a long shot. So you want to have a good amount of balance. That goes for push and pull too. You know, a lot of times people will be like, I do a million push-ups every day. And every once in a while, I'll get in some rear flies on a band. Like, no, no, no. Keep the balance and what you're working with your body. You want to make sure that you're getting things uh, go with something that is uh, more for the stability of the stress throughout the entire body. All right. Next thing that we're talking about. So we had goal line. Let's recap real quick because I've been talking a lot. So the first thing that a good routine has is just can you get in the necessary work for what you're trying to accomplish? That's numero uno, number one. Because a lot of times when people are struggling to get the results they want, it's just they're not consistent with being able to get in the work because they're oftentimes trying to use some program or some methodology that someone said is the best, but it just doesn't align for their schedule or their preferences and stuff. Number two is make sure that you can just get the recovery in. So can you get in the work? Then can you get in the recovery? Uh, number three is, is everything in alignment with your goals and objectives that you want to accomplish? And then finally, number four is in, is it compatible alignment? Is it working with what you can do on a proficiency level? So for example, you know, you, you could have a million people say, oh, okay, pull-ups are the greatest way to build up your back. And you spend hours on the pull-up bar every day. And you're like, I just don't feel it in my lats. I'm just kind of squirming. I've got it all in my joints and it doesn't feel like, okay, I guess I got to do it. But then one day I, I give you like, uh, rows or, uh, you're even, you know, on a weight machine or something you're like, Whoa, Holy smokes. That lights up my back. Go with what you feel with that. It doesn't matter if someone says that something is best, let your body tell you what is best. It doesn't matter what I say, or some influencer out there is saying, this is the best way to do X, Y, and Z. Listen to your body. You want to feel a very visceral reaction to everything that you're doing. When I was training that young lady today and we were able to do something that got her lats light up, she was like, whoa, hello. Like it was like getting punched in the face. It was extremely evident. You don't want your workouts or the exercises that you're doing to be like, yeah, I guess it's working. I think, it, it, you know, if I said, are you feeling it in the chest? Is this working your chest? You shouldn't be telling me, I, I suppose, I, I think, no. Like I said, it's like getting punched in the face. There shouldn't be a whole lot of doubt that it's happening. You should c come off the floor off of those push-ups or the dips or whatever going like, whoa, oh my gosh, my chest is on fire. That's the reaction you're looking for. So plan your programming and your exercises off of whatever just works best with your abilities. If you're having trouble engaging your chest properly during push-ups, but you can get them really working on chest flies, you do the chest flies. Yeah, sure, maybe work in the push-ups as well and see if you can get some carry over there. But if you're feeling like something is just working better for you, you go in that direction. It doesn't matter if someone's like, well, this is the best way to go about it. If it doesn't feel like it's in alignment with what you can do and get the most out of, then don't go in that direction. You go in the direction that feels best for you. And this is something that professional athletes and uh, even uh, you know physique competitors and stuff have long recognized. Dorian Yates had an example years ago where he's like, I just never felt like, like squats did a whole lot for my quads. He always felt like in a hip exercise for me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's his, the way he's built. Maybe it's a technique thing. Who knows? But he's like, boy, I sat on that leg press and my quads lit up like crazy. What do you do? You sit on the leg press. <laughs> 
It doesn't matter if everyone and their grandmother is saying squats are the best things for your quads. You get on an exercise, you feel it more in the muscle, that's what's best for you. End of discussion. So let your body tell you what is working best and don't be afraid to kind of go against convention a little bit because you want to work with your current capabilities and not feel like you're trying to force your body to do something that it just, it's not quite ready for. It doesn't like to do. A couple more questions here before we wrap up. Dan is saying, hey Matt, been working out every day for, for a year with Isochain and progressing. Got to go out of town for five days, not taking my equipment. Curious to see what happens when I get back. Hmm. I mean, two, five days, that's kind of an interesting amount of time. It may be that nothing will happen. It could be that you come back feeling good. Personally, for me, and, and it depends on what you're doing when you're out of town, too. If you're sitting on an airplane the whole time, it's going to be a different story than if you're you know, being fairly active and physically moving around during that. But uh, yeah, it, could, it would be interesting. Uh, for those who are traveling, if you like isometrics, get a World Fit ISO trainer because you can still do a lot of isometric stuff with that. Packs very easily into a suitcase. So that's a good portable isometric device. If you're curious about it, if you're like want to get something on the road. But uh, yeah, it will be interesting. I predict that you probably will recover very well. Make sure eating well, sleeping well. When you come back, your numbers are going to be much higher on that ISO chain. Diego is saying, what are your opinion on people creating their own exercises? It's good to be creative. I like creativity. And a lot of times people come up with some great stuff, you know, even if it does exist already. Like I used to have a barbell curl that I used to do where he kept it in close. Only years later, I found out, oh, you didn't invent anything, dumbass. It's called a drag curl. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. I invented the drag curl again kind of thing. Uh, Dan John, you know, supposedly created the goblet squat. Uh, you've got uh, sissy squats uh, that I had on the suspension straps that if you look at the grind style calisthenics program, it's uh, as far as I know, it's an exercise I invented. It's sissy squats on suspension trainer. And it's very effective and very, very good way to just blast the hell out of your quads. As far as I know, I invented it. But when you get too fancy about it, it can get a little bit meh, crazy. I mean, I've seen people do weird things in the gym you know, and it's kind of like, eh, I don't know if that's just a really overcomplicated way to do bicep curls or if they're onto something there. So definitely be creative, but always remember that your objective is to impact things on the fundamental level. You're not going to make a more effective deadlift because you've got 15 pieces of equipment. <laughs> You're going to just get a good hip hinge with good neuromuscular activation. So be willing to play around with things too. If you do an exercise a certain way and you're like, you know, I noticed that if I just have a little bit of rotation with my hands while doing this, just a little bit, boy, that feels so much better on the joints. Great. Go for it. So creativity is extremely valuable in fitness. By all means, go for it. Just don't get a little too crazy here. You know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Inevitably, a lot of times when people are trying to uh, reinvent something and they're like, I've got all these new exercises I created. A year later, they're the ones going like, stick to the basics, you know, bench, squat, and dead, pull-ups, push-ups, that sort of thing. It's like, yeah, because they figured out that the, most of the best exercises out there are the ones we already know. Mariano, good to see ya. Hey, Matt, out of the four appetites, which do you think is the hardest to learn to find the right spot? So these are the four fundamental appetites that I talk about in my book, Fitness Independence, because a healthy diet satisfies those four things. Let's see if I can remember them here on the spot. Number one is hunger you got to take care of your physiological hunger, you know, first and foremost. Two is nutritional support. Get the vitamins, the minerals, macronutrients, all that sort of thing. Number three is metabolic support. Uh, this one I added because uh, when I was uh, learning about the fundamental appetites, that was when low carbs started to really be a big deal. And in my world, the, card the um, endurance athletes, the bikers, the runners and stuff, they'd be like, I don't know why I feel like crap after running a few miles. I'm like, because you've got nothing in the tank, dude. Eat some carbs. And then finally, the last one is just hidden, hidden, hedonistic or hedonic support. You know, taste, enjoyment, texture, social interaction. Food is supposed to be a very enjoyable, pleasurable thing. And we're not giving ourselves that hedonic support. That's when we get a lot of the cravings and uh, the associated uh, inadequacies with the diet. 
So which one's the one to find the right spot? That's a very good question. I would probably say it's that hedonic spot because a lot of times in our dietary culture, you've got two groups that are either saying food is just fuel. It doesn't matter how you feel. Food's not supposed to be enjoyable. You know, you're, we'd all be living on bean curds and that glop they fed people in the, that movie, the matrix. If they had our way, it's like, you're not supposed to get any pleasure from food. It's only food for fuel and things like that. And yeah, when you're getting ready for a bodybuilding competition, that may be the attitude you need to take, but that's not like real life for most people. But on the other hand, you've got the total uh, other side where people are like, I don't want to live forever. I'm going to enjoy myself. And they'll just eat nothing but hyper palatable junk foods and ultra processed foods all the time and call that living. But we need to find that sweet spot where we're getting a lot of enjoyment and pleasure from all our foods and from everything that we're eating. But we don't want to go overboard with things and make that the dominant thing because that's the reason why the four fundamental appetites work is when you try to overemphasize any one of them, you're compromising one of the other three or maybe even all three. So they all form a safety net that keeps you in a very balanced, healthy diet. So when we're looking at the hedonic support, we need to recognize how much do you need to be satisfied, but how much do you need to, to eat in order to do that? And that's going to be different a little bit for everybody. But because those two messages are so prevalent in our fitness culture, many of us don't know how to eat in a balanced way to satisfy that hedonic appetite. What a great question. Fantastic. Raindrop is asking, hey, Matt, my mom always says her back is stiff. Any tips for helping her recover? So remember that tightness and stiffness is usually due to weakness uh, in the associated muscles. Like my, mu my hips are always tight because I know they're also relatively weak I'm working on that largely with isometrics, but it also usually means that other muscles are usually not engaging as well. So for your mom's example, I'm willing to bet it's her lower back. And oftentimes that means abs and hips are not strong enough, glutes and hamstrings. And chronic tightness is usually not the result of a lack of stretching and foam rolling. It's usually from something else. So I would bet money that something on our backside is not strong enough. Glutes and hamstrings would be my first bet. Lats would be the second, uh, either above or below the joint, because the lower back is like a joint. It's not so much a muscle group. Uh, it doesn't need to be stretched. The other muscles need to be strengthened because they take on the stress instead of the lower back. That's where I would go uh, first and foremost. Oop, excuse me. Pudgy Plasma is saying, hey, I wanted to offer, whoop, sorry. Uh, I get all that stuff all the time, folks. All the people are like, I can increase your views. I can be so give you a new email newsletter and stuff like that. Oh, man, it's crazy how much people are trying to proposition me with stuff like that. You get over 100,000 views on YouTube and everything changes, folks. Oh, boy, they come out of the word work. All right, Raindot Media is saying, what is the gym myth that you hate the most? I don't hate a lot of myths because they're usually based on good things. Uh, most myths in our fitness culture are just ideas that are overdone. They're extrapolated to a very high degree. Uh, I'm probably going to have to think about it for a few minutes, but um, probably the one that drives me the most crazy is that uh, it's just hard work always pays off. You know, more work is always better. Or hard work is always worthwhile. Not at all. We have to be very diligent about how we spend our time and energy. It's not worthwhile just because it's hard. Again, going back to that burpee video I did about uh, criticizing the, the burpee uh, for you know not being all that great in exercise and stuff. A lot of the folks who criticize it say, ah, these people, they don't like burpees because they're hard and they're just being wimps and everything like that. There is nothing wimpy about not wanting to do hard things. That's called intelligence. It's stupid to want to do it because it is hard. Because no, it's not effective just because it's hard. I know how, where they're coming from. I used to be that way. I loved anything that would kick my ass back in the day. In fact, I would do things purposely for the single reason that it would kick my ass. I would go for a bike ride during the hottest time of the day, wearing a heavy sweatshirt, no water, no shoes, because I wanted the pedals to tear up my feet. I was only happy if they were bleeding literally. And I, I would get this sort of self-righteous macho enjoyment from putting myself through whatever hardship I could mentally, emotionally, my lifestyle, didn't matter what it was. I want to do anything that physically beat me down. 
because I thought that was a thing that was going to make me tougher and stronger, but it wasn't. It just made me weaker <laughs> and it made me slower and it was a bad use of my time and energy. I think that's probably the one that gets me the most is when people are taking too much pleasure and pride in how hard they work. There's nothing special about hard work. Everybody works hard. You know, there's the guys like me who are like, I'm the hardest worker in the room. No, I was the most incompetent worker in the room. I was working that hard because I didn't know what I was doing. And I regret it. I really honestly regret it. Don't fall for the myths that I used to, that hard work is always worthwhile that it's worth it just because it's harder and that harder is best. Hard work is not an asset, ladies and gentlemen. It is a liability. It's nothing more than spending energy and resources. That's all it is. It's the easiest thing to do. The laziest thing you can do is to vow to just work harder because it's the easiest thing to do. So usually working harder just means doing more of what you're already doing. You're not learning. You're not improving anything. You're not trying to get better. You're just beating yourself into the ground. It's lazy first and foremost. And boy, don't I regret it. Oh, big time regret. And that's probably why I don't like it that much. Super Prime 117 saying, what is your opinion on putting direct light impact on the body to increase bone density to prevent injury? I don't think it's a good way to go about it, my friend. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a classic martial arts thing. You know, people punching onto like makiwara boards and we use this in Taekwondo called knocking where we're hitting forearms against each other and stuff like that. We used to do all sorts of conditioning, but it, when it comes to being able to strengthen the bones, funny enough, the best way to actually strengthen your bones is with strength training because most of the stress on our bones comes from the contractile pulling force of the muscles. The Stronger by Science did a really insightful um, podcast on this. It was it was very interesting where Greg Knuckles was talking about like you do a lateral raise with a five pound dumbbell out to the side and you're thinking, great, it's five pounds. It's not putting that much force on. But the amount of contractile force in the muscle itself is like something like 300 pounds or something on the actual bone. It's ridiculous. The amount of forces going into your bone from your muscles directly from strength training is probably far more than any sort of light impact that you would be having. So the knocking can be good if you want to strengthen and desensitize yourself in specific areas like the forearms or the shins or something that you know you're going to be making impact with. But when it comes to actually strengthening your skeleton, just good old fashioned strength training, my friend, of whatever type you like. All right, next question. I've been doing uh, using ring dips for my sedentary bench day and I'm loving them so much, fantastic. Only able to crank out six reps. <laughs> Thank you for introducing me to them. Fantastic. I don't know why you're calling that a secondary, oh, secondary bench day. Sorry, I misread. <laughs> I thought you were saying you were doing that as an off day. I'm like, dude, if you're getting six reps, that's still heavy training. That's not your rest day. <laughs> no, secondary bench day. Yes, excellent. Very smart. Very, very good. And your shoulders will probably thank you for it to it as well. Make sure your back is engaging very much. When you're on those rings, you should feel like it's kind of a bit of a back exercise as well. Then make sure your back tension is also carrying over to your bench press. It'll help protect your shoulders as well. Uh, very smart, very smart way to program that, actually. Crystal Ball is saying, what's your opinion on combining power lifting with calisthenics in a program? Yeah, fantastic. You can combine anything you want. You know, I love combining different things. I'm never a fan of, you know, do one thing. Grind style calisthenics is technically four things. It's kind of just where you draw the line on those uh, types of ideas. But yeah, mix and match. Always remember that fitness is completely open source, my friends. Add in anything you want. Discard anything you want, as long as you're keeping things balanced and in alignment with your goals and stuff. There's nothing in there that you have to do, but there's also nothing that you have to exclude either. So I get that question a lot from people. They're into the calisthenics thing, but they're kind of like, yeah, but I still really kind of crave those deadlifts. Like, Great, so do the deadlifts. You know, there's no reason why you shouldn't include whatever you want into your program. Uh, because if you want to do it, there's a very good chance that your body and your mind is saying, this is worthwhile to do. We're getting something out of this. In which case I say, good go, <laughs> do the thing. It doesn't matter what it is, you know, add things in. Fitness is open source. People have been combining and blending things together for ages. Do likewise, my friends. Raindrop Media is saying, I completed a level three course in personal training. Congrats. 
I'm qualified to start training people, but is that career path worth it? Oh, hey, you're asking a wrong guy on that one. Personal training is a hard career, man. It really is. I remember years ago, I read a book on something about, it was something about financial career paths for smart people or something like that. And it had a list of things like, these are the things you want in a good rewarding career. And these are the things you don't want. And it the things that you don't want was exactly describing personal training. <laughs> It was like, make sure you're getting benefits. No, we don't get any benefits. Make sure you get time off. You don't get time off. Make sure you're not trading hours for dollars. Yeah, that's all you're ever doing. Make sure you have reliable income. You don't have a reliable income. Make sure you have a reliable schedule. You don't have a reliable schedule. Like a lot of times when I would talk to my friends and stuff and they'd be like, well, you you do your training though because you love it. I'm like, yeah, that's about the only reason to do it because all the other things suck. Um, but I don't want you to feel discouraged from it because it can be a very rewarding uh, uh, profession and you can get around those things, you know, when it comes to like, I've, I'm doing financially, I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right. I'm supporting myself and everything, but it took me over 10 years to get to that point. Some people get there a lot faster, but uh, there's a reason why the majority of personal trainers I've ever known always have second jobs because they can't make ends meet with training. Uh, or they, they just don't have uh, the secondary thing. So that's why a lot of times people will find that uh, they, they, we don't want to be trainers, in, in all honesty. Most people don't want to be personal trainers. They just want to help people get in shape. And these days, there's so many ways you can do that. You can create, well, YouTube channels. You can write books. You can have a podcast. You can have social media po posts and things like that. A lot of times, people, we just want to help people get in better shape. And you don't necessarily need to make that a career. You can make it a side hustle. You can make it something that you do just as a, a feel good project sort of thing. So it's, it's like a lot of businesses. People do it because they feel it's rewarding beyond the financial and monetary things. And there's a lot of good strategies you can do. I mean, there are certainly trainers out there that make a lot of money. You know, it's not something that's impossible, but it's kind of like, I, I always likened it to, to being an artist, you know, or a, a musician or something like, yeah, there's people making millions of dollars a year being a recording artist. But if you ask most artists how they're doing, they're like, great, I got a new job, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's helping me pay the bills. And then I go play uh, gigs on the weekend stuff. So dip your toe in, but uh, have fun with it and uh, be, uh, ask me questions, you know, hit me up reddeltaproject at gmail.com if you ever want to uh, confer about a, a little bit and stuff and ask for advice. So I'm here to help. David's saying, Stu McGill says the impact of walking on the heels releases enough of a cascade to help bone density. Yeah, it, again, it doesn't take much to get bone density going, folks. It's why a lot of people, when they get older, they're losing um, bone density because they're literally doing nothing at all. But some people, they have fairly decent bone density. And it's like, what are you doing? Well, I garden. I walk the dog, I mow the lawn and stuff. We don't need 500 pounds on our back doing back squats to build adequate bone density. <clears throat> Raindrop Media, good overall question. Thoughts on Athlean X? To be honest with you, I don't have many thoughts on anybody out there, uh, which I know may kind of seem a little bit funny, but my eyes are in my own lane. I'm sweeping my own porch, so to speak. My attention is so focused on my own stuff and what I'm doing. To be honest with you, I'm barely paying attention to anybody out there. You know, when the liver king kind of got busted for using steroids, everybody's like, liver king, oh my God, what happened? I'm standing there in the gym going, who the hell's a liver king? What are you guys talking about? I'm like, this guy's on steroids. And of course, I look at the picture and I'm like, well, duh. Of course, this is news, you know, kind of thing. But I don't pay attention to a whole lot of people, to be honest with you. Uh, unless I'm using their products and advices personally and directly because I find it's helpful, like the Cavadlo brothers or GMB Fitness and, and stuff. Uh, those are the folks I pay attention to because of like, oh, this is a good book kind of thing. But for the most part, I don't really get out much <laughs> when it comes to other uh, thoughts and ideas out there. Like I don't sit around watching YouTube videos on fitness. I don't have really any podcasts that I listen to on fitness other than Stronger by Science. You know, I, I'm too busy making my own stuff to pay attention to many other people, what they're saying. So yeah, that's my thoughts. I don't have one because I don't really know much about them. All right. 
couple last ones to wrap up here real quick here. Cristobal, can you tell us about your current strength training program? I don't have one, <laughs> folks. Uh, read my push-pull squat program. That's probably going to be the best one that's going to give you an idea of what it's about. Doing a lot of isometrics these days, but I've always had a very flexible approach to things. Every day is very different. I just kind of do what I can do and work to create the stimuli that I'm after. But I don't have a, even a workout routine. I don't have a workout. I don't usually say, okay, time for my workout. You know, I'll get my pull-ups while I'm making a burrito. I'll get some stretch outs at the gym while working, while uh, waiting for my next client to arrive. Um, you know, I'll sit on the floor and stretch while they're doing push-ups, kind of thing. I just kind of get my micro workouts in here and there. I don't really do a whole lot of traditional workouts these days anymore. I've got to kind of fit it in my in my daily life when and where I can. Uh, oops, sorry, got that one already. I meant to hit this one. Nico M. How uh, come you're using World Fit Iso Trainer over the Bull Worker Iso Flow, knowing there's more variability? Uh, on the isoflow. So the biggest reason, first and foremost, is the world fit is just a longer strap. Uh, so I can get the strap underneath a step or something that I can get a lot more stability to. I like the isoflow, but the, it's two straps and you need to connect them together. And it's just a lot easier to use the iso, uh, the iso trainer because it's just one and I just zip, I adjust it and I can do overhead presses and things like that. Uh, it's also a, a one and a half inch strap which is a lot more comfortable against the body than the one inch strap of the ISO flow. Uh, so that way, if I'm doing, you know, chest presses or I've got it wrapped around my feet or something for rows, it's just a lot more comfortable. So the ISO trainer is just a lot easier to adjust. Uh, it's a lot more uh, variable as far as the height goes and uh, it's more ergonomic and the handles are beefier too. I like that as well. Those are the biggest reasons. Why I just, again, personal preference. Equipment is like that, folks. You know, when it comes to the best equipment, it's like, just use whatever you like, whatever fit, fits your body best. Oh, I got that one already. A couple last ones. Mech Flash is, is it better to do push-ups every day, every other day for muscle gain? Either. doesn't really matter how you do it. Remember, you're just creating that fatigue and recovering from it. So when you do something more frequently, you're just not working as hard so you can recover quicker. So if you think of it like a cycle, where it's like, okay, every day I'm creating a little fatigue, little recovery, little fatigue, little recovery, little fatigue, little recovery, more frequently. Or if you're like, I do it once a week, a lot of fatigue, a lot of recovery, a lot of fatigue, a lot of recovery. You're doing the same thing fundamentally. It's just uh, your cycle is either bigger or smaller, but you're doing the same thing. The bottom line though is, are you progressing? I don't care how hard you're working. I don't care how many pushups you can do. Every day, every, a thousand, every seven days and stuff, doesn't matter. What's better about your push-ups now than a week ago? That's what's going to be the most important thing. Are you able to do more in a single shot? Is your technique getting better? Are you getting more tension in the muscle? That's the stuff you want to pay attention to. That's the stuff that's going to create a stronger stimulus and progressive stimulus for your hypertrophy. Diego saying, very generous person, Matt. Thank you for all your useful advice. Thank you very much. I'm glad you think so. I do the best I can here, folks. I'm always limited by my current knowledge and perspectives, so that's why I work hard every single day to increase it and bring more to the table for you folks. And I always appreciate your feedback. If, you're, uh, if you like what I'm saying, let me know. If you don't like what I'm saying, definitely let me know. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm not covering something that you guys want me to address. You know, Or maybe I'm not explaining things very well. I'm doing the best I can. So if you think of any ways that I can do it better, I am all ears. I am certainly not above getting criticized by any means. I'm doing this for you folks. Oh, I got that one already. Sorry, I keep hitting things num numerous times. <clears throat> so following up on the push-up things, McFlash is saying, so what if I did 100 reps? No idea. I don't know. What's 100 reps relative to what you did last week? That's the real, that's what we always have to ask ourselves. Okay, so what if you make $1,000? Okay, well, first off, is it $1,000 a year or $1,000 in an hour? <laughs> Everything's time-based. But more importantly, it's like, what if I did 100 reps? Like, let's say you had a job and I'm like, okay, this new job pays $80,000 a year. Okay, is, is, is that good? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Because it's like, no, dude, I made $200,000 last year. That's a pay cut. Or you could say, great, that's much better than what I was making. It's all relative to what you were doing. That's always what you want to ask yourself. How is it better than before? You know, because we, our fitness culture loves to give us these ideas of this is the best way or this is the right way to do things. That's all nonsense. 
it, don't worry too much about that. It's all guesswork. You know, I could write out a program, put it online and be like, here, do this. I'm like, I'm guessing. I'm purely guessing. I have no idea what you actually need. That's why people come see me in person. That's, that's my job as a coach is to look at them and go, okay, what can you do now? Okay. Yeah. All right. I see your current abilities. Okay. Now here's 1% better that we're going to strive for. That's what gets the results better than before. Is hundred pushups better than before, or is your technique sucky? Or could you do 50 before? And now you can do hundred, but you were doing 200. And now you're doing hundred. That's even worse. It's always relative to what were you doing? How is it better? Always asking ourselves, what can I do better? How can I do this better? A progression in the stimulus. <clears throat> EJ Miller, hey, just wanted to let you know the 12 month GSC program on your site links to Teespring, not the, rec not the uh, program uh, PDF. Yeah, Teespring is where my uh, PDFs are available. Uh, sorry for the confusion there if I didn't make that clear. So Teespring is where the RDP merch store is. And so the quick read section is on the the pdfs for that i think the pdfs i think it is available on amazon if i actually just remembered i think you can get it on kindle um but i usually just link to the merch store because i know a lot of people prefer pdfs for that sort of thing and i can't do pdfs for you via amazon at least i don't think so uh, i haven't found a way to do it so a lot of people prefer that but yeah teespring is the rdp merch store that's where you can find all those quick reads um is it better uh for long-term progress uh, weighted calisthenics or progressive technique, either, both. They actually do the same thing. <laughs> They're not any different, or at least they shouldn't be. Uh, if they are very different for you, then something's wrong. But basically the same thing. If I'm doing push-ups and I add a 40 pound weight vest, I'm adding weight to my hands. If I'm doing push-ups and then I do archer push-ups, I'm shifting more weight. I'm adding weight to my hand. So progressive technique and weighted uh, technique it's fundamentally the same thing. So therefore it does the same thing. Uh, at least it should be. And uh, that's why I combine the two into one book, uh, my progressive calisthenics and weighted calisthenics, because they're technically the same thing. They're just, you know, different ways of making the same applesauce. AB is asking, I like to warm up with calisthenics, hit the weights and finish up with calisthenics to hypertrophy. If I lift in the three to five rep range, should I go to calisthenics or just finish out with weights? You could do either. You know, because remember, calisthenics is still weightlifting. It, just as I was saying earlier, it's the same thing fundamentally. Uh, so it's not really different, but you're smart about looking at it from a progressive standpoint. So if you're hitting three to five rep range, uh, that's for your weights, I'm assuming. That you, so you're going heavy. That's what I like to do. I like to go heavy first and then give myself a good light finisher. And uh, yeah, and then finish. You can do it with weights or with calisthenics. But be mindful of what exercises you can take to a higher degree of fatigue with higher reps. I've always liked calisthenics for that just because I find it's a lot easier for me to push myself a lot harder with bodyweight training. But that's just me. Who cares what I say? What's most important is for you. You may find that you can push yourself harder with some techniques than for others. That's what you want to base that off of when you're doing those finishers. And finally, we got McFlash saying, uh, what's a prerequisite push-up should you be able to do a perfect one to be able to do a perfect one arm push up. No, I don't. I don't believe in the prerequisite thing too much because uh, if you can go, go. You know, if you can start to train one arm push ups, it's going to be sloppy and crappy anyway. When you start off, nobody does it well at first. So if you can go for it, go for it. You could do a progressive technique, of course, on an elevated surface like one arm push ups on a countertop. Uh, so you can do all sorts of things. But no, I mean, there are guys out there who can do a thousand push ups a day and they can't even come close to a one arm push up. Other guys, they'd be like, yeah, I don't ever do more than 10 push-ups and they can knock out one-arm push-ups like nothing. So be more mindful of your shoulder stability and technique. That's going to be the more uh, close representation of those sorts of things. But you, you know, a lot of people, they're jumping ahead to that sort of thing. Archer push-ups and so forth. Spend more time on those. Get what you can out of the lower, lower technical rep ranges or uh, progressions. Super Prime is saying to expand upon the bone density thing. What do you think about Shaolin monks train? I always read a study where they bang their head against the wall gently an hour a day and their skull got insane. Yeah, you, you're going to definitely build up bone wherever you're hitting things for sure. The big question is why do you need more bone density in those specific areas? So like I said, in the martial arts, that is key because we're banging our forearms against each other 
that matters. That makes sense. But for the average individual, who cares? So what? It doesn't really matter very much. So if you're doing um, specific bone density, that might be uh, helpful. But usually just general bone density will be more than what to take uh, care of you. All right. So I got to take off, folks. I'm meeting with a buddy of mine to uh, discuss more fitness and business stuff over sushi. Uh, and we're going to make a fun video that's going to come out on the YouTube uh, fairly soon here. So make sure you're subscribed, checking up on that sort of thing. But thank you, everybody, for coming on in as always. Thank you for joining me here on my new digs. I'm probably going to have a lot of differences uh, in the gym, building up a lot of new equipment and stuff like that, new videos here that I can't wait to show you. And hopefully the gym downstairs too, because it really is a nice place. But don't forget all the resources down below that I was mentioning, Overcoming Isometrics, Grind Style Calisthenics, the RDP Merch Store, links to all those is down below, helps to support the show. And uh, it's much appreciated. And uh, I will see you folks again next week. Till then, be fit and live free.